Philanthropy. And it's my pleasure to welcome today Kathy Rich and Chris Cardona from the Ford Foundation. You, we sent out links to their impressive bios, so I won't regurgitate those here. Uh, but uh, I do want to start with a note that there's kind of a unifying force here in this room. And that is that I think probably every one of you have some kind of dissatisfaction with the status quo that leads you to make an abiding commitment to addressing uh, critical societal issues and giving your energy to that. Uh, the Ford Foundation, I, uh, several years back, had a leadership change. And after doing some reflection, you know, was driven by a dissatisfaction with their status quo and has really made a major shift in their grant making to be more strategic, to be more long term, and make deeper and longer commitments to the kind of organizational strengthening that's necessary for their grantees to uh, extend their reach and impact over time. And, uh, you know, I think. Chris and Kathy would be the first to tell you that they're not the first foundation to make this change. Uh, you'll see later on uh, today on our panel, we have some folks who've worked with Lily Endowment. And uh, Lily Endowment has been doing, uh, approaching its grant making in, the, in a similar way for, for many, many years. We have a panel tomorrow in Fort Wayne with the um, Follinger Foundation, and the folks they work with are going to be represented. And they've also taken a very um, long term strategic approach to the grant making, among others. But if you kind of look out across our sector, I'd say that this kind of grant making is more rare than not. Uh, most people are still in kind of annual cycles, and uh, we all know, uh, it's been written about widely, that the funding available for institutional strengthening is often uh, in short supply. So <clears throat> what makes Ford stand out Besides, it had the courage to make a billion dollar commitment to changing the way it does its grant making, is that it's made a really significant commitment to learning. And the learning is internal to help them figure out uh, better and better ways uh, as they go along to, uh, to um, uh, develop and design and deploy their grant making, but also uh, to the community, uh, the philanthropic community, and uh, being willing to share things that they're learning uh, that might be able to benefit others. So it's in that spirit that I welcome, welcome Kathy and Chris. Uh, Ford was really smart in my estimation to hire people with their kind of background and expertise. Both of them are very strong in organizational development and what makes uh, for successful organizations. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I've been impressed with how deeply committed they are to the spirit of learning. And it's in that spirit that uh, they'll talk with us today, sharing some of their insights, and then I think also provoking discussion that can help everybody in this room uh, who, in their own respective battles, uh, trying to improve a less than satisfactory status quo. So we welcome Kathy to the stage.
So, I direct this program called BUILD at the Ford Foundation. And it's a five-year, billion-dollar commitment, it's actually now a six-year, billion-dollar commitment, to strengthen institutions around the world that focus on inequality. So essentially, our hypothesis here, and we, the hypothesis has been informed by 80 years of grant making, is that social justice organizations, like any other organizations, need strong capacity to thrive. They need to invest in strategy and learning, they need to invest in leadership, talent, and building a healthy organizational culture. And they need to be financially resilient. If they're strong in all of these areas, we think, they will be better able to adapt to change and more resilient to shocks in their internal operations or in their external environments. In turn, this adaptability and resilience will make them better at what they do producing better outcomes for the people they represent and serve. And in the long run, reducing inequality in all of its forms. Thus far, we have made build grants to about 270 organizations in 26 different countries. About 60% of the organizations are based here in the United States. Um, close to a majority of those are led by people of color. And across the build organizations around the world, a majority of them are women-led. What do you get when you get a build grant? Our grant-making model is pretty simple. We invite organizations that we see as long-term strategic partners to join the program, and we give each of them five years of support. A majority of each build grant comes in the form of unrestricted support. And the rest, on average, about 35% of the grant, is what we call core support for institutional strengthening. Each build organization goes through an organizational assessment in their first year. They develop their own priorities for strengthening their institutions in areas like strategy, talent, financial sustainability. And then the institutional strengthening portion of the grant funds that work over time. So what do they do with it? Sometimes they hire new staff in places like HR, communications, development, um, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Sometimes they bring on expert consultants. And sometimes they invest in new systems and new stuff, whether it's hardware or software um, or digital security. Um, it's all as they see fit. We don't tell build grantee partners how to strengthen their institutions. We ask them to tell us what they want to do. The ethos of grantee in the driver's seat drives build. Throughout the five years, we try to minimize those inevitable power dynamics between funders and grantees by listening to our partners deeply and by trusting them to make their own strategic and operational decisions. That sounds really easy, right? But in fact, we know that flexible long-term support for nonprofits is all too rare in our field. It's even rarer to see donors and nonprofit partners working to try to equalize the power dynamics that distort the nonprofit sector, where all too often foundations are the kingmakers and nonprofits are the supplicants. So, what gets in our way? I'd like to talk today mostly about barriers, about the barriers that get in the way of funders supporting nonprofits in ways that are strategic, sustainable, and designed to maximize positive outcomes for funders, nonprofits, and the people that we all serve. I think if we look at the research and listen to the people who are working every day to enact transformational change, we have a pretty good idea what type of funding gets the best results. It's funding that is long-term, that is flexible, and that adequately resources organizations to strengthen their institutions and deliver results on their program work. And I'd like to offer just a couple pieces of evidence that support this point. So first, in 2017, uh, Susan Dickkoff and Abe Grindle from Bridgefan published a study in the Harvard Business Review called Audacious Philanthropy. They analyzed 15 philanthropic initiatives that had led to long-term, large-scale systems change. It was everything from ending apartheid to eradicating polio to achieving tobacco control. But all of these initiatives had a few things in common. And Dickkoff and Grindle wrote, at the highest level, the successful strategies we uncovered ran counter to prevailing funding practices. 
They included decades-long persistence, even when the pace of change was slow, financial support for collaboration among key actors, even when it meant giving up some control, and big philanthropic bets that shifted power from the donor to the doers and the beneficiaries. Second, in 2017 and 2018, Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors published two reports, Scaling Solutions to Shift Systems. Like Bridge Ban, RPA studied a dozen successful social change efforts and identified funder practices most likely to contribute to systems change. These included collaborating more effectively with other funders and nonprofit partners, accelerating impact through support for institutional strengthening, and empowering grantees by intentionally shifting the power dynamics between the givers and receivers of funds. But according to the Center for Effective Philanthropy in the US today, less than 30% of foundation funding comes to nonprofits in the form of unrestricted support. And although 95% of foundation leaders say they care about their grantees' overall organizational health, only 43% of nonprofit leaders say that a majority of their funders care about their overall organizational health. I think the funders know better. So the question is, why don't we do better? As somebody who used to fund only projects, I was that funder, I've heard and at times I've even made all of the arguments about why we can't give larger, longer, more flexible grants that really focus on strengthening institutions. Broadly speaking, these arguments fall into four areas. Concern about accountability, concerns about strategy and impact, concerns about structural limitations within philanthropy itself, and concerns about trust and control. I'd like to take each of those areas of objection in turn and posit a few ideas to counter or even hopefully dismantle them. First, accountability concerns. These are things like, I just can't trust that nonprofit's capacity to spend the money effectively and efficiently. Or, you know, this grantee's had their problems, and I want to keep this grant as project support to incent better behavior. I think these arguments can be traced back to a core misperception. That somehow giving flexible funding means that the funder is giving up the right to conduct due diligence before making a grant, or to conduct effective monitoring over the course of the grant. To the contrary, I think that funders who have succeeded in funding long-term, large-scale systems change have made due diligence and monitoring a cornerstone of their efforts. At Build over the last three years, we've steadily improved on our due diligence practices before we make grants. So for example, we now conduct a detailed financial analysis before making every grant. We also conduct due diligence on other aspects of organizational health, including leadership and governance, strategy, and organizational culture. The vast majority of our build grants now follow a one plus four structure, where the first year is a planning year that allows the grantee to develop their institutional strengthening priorities and allows us to develop deeper trust and partnership and understanding about their work. So far, out of the more than 270 build grants we've made, fewer than five have not continued past the first year. So um, all of that due diligence paid <coughs> off in terms of we know what we're getting into, but it's, it does not lead us to walk away in all but the most extreme cases. And as for using a project grant to incent better behavior, um, how many of you are parents? What, what happens when you try to pay somebody to change their behavior? I, it does not work well for me as a parent. Maybe you can give me some advice. Um, but we are seeing in BUILD that flexible money incents all kinds of positive behavior. As our independent third-party evaluation team has told us, and this is a quote, the commitment to five years of predictable funding enables grantees to focus on reflective, strategic, and structured strengthening of their organizations, networks, and partnerships. This seems to be true across the size of the grantee, the percentage of budget represented by BUILD, geography, and programmatic focus. So in other words, whether you are consumers union, an 80-year-old, multi-multi-million dollar nonprofit in the United States, or whether you are Leap Africa, a youth development nonprofit based in Lagos, Nigeria, this kind of money enables you to think differently um, and 
to try harder and to do better. We're also finding that grantees are more likely to come to us as a trusted partner in addressing or advising on program or organizational change challenges, rather than just presenting us with the shiny good news. We learned that the flexible, long-term nature of the BUILD grant often makes program officers more attentive to monitoring and not less. In BUILD grants, the program officers conduct two in-depth site visits every year, and during those visits, they don't just concentrate on program, right, and what's going on in program, but on questions of organizational health. Other funders that engage in this type of grant making, like the Blue Meridian Partners, uh, offer even more <coughs> intensive accompaniment to their grants. One program officer at Ford recently told me that it's far more rewarding to manage a build grant. He says he feels like he is stewarding and helping an organization, not just a project. Project grants and monitoring and management are often limited to the reports, the events, the data, the work plans, the timelines. Like we're funders, we like all those things, right? But more flexible funding allows us to manage to a vision, right? Are we headed in the right direction? Do we need course correction? So I guess the question I'm asking about all these accountability concerns is, if you're concerned that a grantee won't be accountable on a flexible grant, why are you equally concerned that they won't be accountable on a project grant? Right? Why, why make them a grant at all? So the second set of concerns are around strategy and impact. I often hear that flexible grants aren't strategic because they are not tied to achieving specific outcomes or this close cousin, I can't assess impact on general support or capacity building grants. I'm not here to attack the concept of strategic philanthropy itself, but I do question who is involved in developing strategy and who gets to define the outcomes we are striving for at foundations. As funders, we spend millions of dollars every year developing and implementing strategies <coughs> And it's shocking to me how few of those strategies are developed in close partnership with the nonprofits who are actually going to be implementing them. We define the outcomes within the foundation. We define the terms of engagement, and nonprofits have to contort their own outcomes to suit ours. And mind you, they have to do this with every funder who supports them. So they find themselves working to achieve outcomes not against their own theories of change but against those of 10 or 15 different funders. And you add into this mix that nonprofits receive the lion's share of their funding in one year increments, and that project grants rarely include sufficient dollars for critical overhead expenses. Ironically, the grantee's own monitoring and evaluation counts as an overhead expense, right? So you see the pictures start to emerge. Funders are asking nonprofits to achieve systemic change using outcomes and indicators that the nonprofits do not get to define, imposing rigid deliverables and timelines, and giving them insufficient funding to deliver. Imagine the gymnastics that nonprofits have to go through to succeed. So I'd like to flip those arguments about strategy and evaluation on their head. In my mind, it's not that the long-term, large, institutionally focused grants are unstrategic. To the contrary, I think they are the, among the most strategic ways to fund. When we make a build grant at Ford, it's because we have confidence that an organization's mission, position, and work are closely aligned to our objectives as a funder. Their vision of change in the world and the approaches that they take to actualize that vision align with our own values and analysis. This knowledge also influences how we evaluate the grants. Rather than counting the widgets, right, the, the influence campaigns they've waged, or the reports they've published, or the people they've trained, we try to focus on what difference the organization is really making, and how they are adjusting based on what they are learning. We take a broad view of impact, assessing it in multiple layers and directions. The impact on the grantee institution itself, the impact enabled by our support on their programs, the grantee's influence within its field, and how well they partner with others. And of course, we've gotten comfortable with the reality at the Ford Foundation that when we evaluate impact, we are looking at best for contribution. We're not about taking credit, and we cannot attribute things directly to the results of our grants. So third, these concerns about structural barriers. Funders tell me all the time that their budgets do not allow for multi-year commitments. 
but I think what they mean is their grants budgets don't allow them to fund nearly as many organizations with multi-year grants as they can with single-year grants. Funding over multiple years requires making some really tough choices. Larger grants means fewer grants. In the Ford Foundation's case, we went through some very complicated budgeting maneuvers to create a $1 billion fund for build that we could manage over the five years, right? Not annually. And in practical terms, this meant we ended up slashing funding for some other long-running programs. And um, I'm not going to lie, that caused some real pain um, to our grantees and to our program staff. But I also don't think you have to go to quite the extremes we did um, to make longer <coughs> grants. Multi-year grants can be valuable to nonprofits even if the grants themselves are not particularly large. The average bill grade in the U.S. is about $5 million over five years. Some grants are as small as $1 million over five years. What we found matters to the build grantees is not the absolute size of the grant, but its multi-year commitment, its flexibility, the size of the grant in relation to what they used to get for us, the previous support, and the fact that some of those funds are specifically designated for the institutional strengthening that other donors won't fund. So a more serious concern, in my view, is that larger grants often go to larger organizations, squeezing smaller grassroots nonprofits out of grant portfolios. This is a real danger, particularly as we funders have become more serious about monitoring and evaluation. It takes a certain capacity just for a nonprofit to keep up with a funder, to write the reports, to track the outcomes, and to speak the, uh, the funder speak that we like to speak, right? And I understand the constraints on the funder side as well. Grants to smaller organizations often take more effort because they demand closer um, attention by the program officer. And some of the problem is just a numbers game. It's more difficult to manage 20 small grants than it is to manage five large ones. So I can think of at least two ways to address what I think is a, is a very real problem um, of crowding out the smaller nonprofits. So in BUILD, we have actually tried very hard to have a mix of larger, more established nonprofits and smaller, more nascent organizations in our portfolio. Um, time and our external evaluation will tell on this one, but our feeling, and the evaluator's feeling three years in, is that if anything, the smaller organizations are finding BUILD more transformative than the larger ones. The funds are enabling them to, to invest in talent, and infrastructure that they've never had before, and to plan for long-term stability. <coughs> so the second thing we're doing in BUILD is that we are making BUILD grants to partners like Borealis Philanthropy in the US and the African Women's Development Fund in Ghana, which themselves provide funding and capacity building to grassroots organizations. Intermediaries like these are much closer to the ground than we are at the Ford Foundation. And they are set up to provide mentoring to smaller organizations in ways that we just can't do. We're not good at it in the same ways that they are. So I was really encouraged that um, one European aid agency invested in African Women's Development Fund at the same time that we did. We gave them a $3 million build grant. This agency gave them more than $20 million in re-granting funds for women's rights organizations throughout Africa. But it was really discouraging that that big European aid agency grant um, had a 5% overhead rate. It didn't cover the critical staffing and the, and the infrastructure that AWDF needed to have to actually send those grants out into the world and, and do them well. And luckily, they had our build funding to support that. That brings us to the last bucket, and that this is the hardest one. Um, Unfortunately, I think that most of the arguments I hear against larger, longer, more flexible grants come down to two factors, lack of trust and a desire for control. Frequently, those factors are rooted in the CEO suite or in the boardroom, but just as often, they are rooted in the rank and file among program staff who have worked for decades to build their expertise and believe they know best what the field needs. To me, issues of trust and control are the ultimate barrier, and they're the hardest one to overcome. I must confess that I haven't found any of the considerable evidence in favor of more flexible grant making to be persuasive in changing deeply held beliefs. I think as we're all finding in this world these days, all the evidence in the world is sometimes not enough to change a deeply held belief. 
What has worked, at least for many of the staff at Ford, is just trying it. Many staff at Ford who were deeply skeptical about the build approach to grant making are now evangelists for it. And they have changed their minds because they are seeing strong programmatic results. And they are benefiting from deeper, more candid, more authentic relationships with the leaders and the organizations they fund. How do we get people to overcome that ultimate barrier and just try it? Even as a small scale experiment, what do you see as the biggest challenges to this approach? What's needed to overcome those challenges? Is it evidence? Is it peer influence? Is it space to experiment? How can we help make the case? So those are the questions I close with to you. I really look forward to the conversation. And uh, I'm ready for any questions you have. Kathy, if you, if you fast forward three years to the end of the sixth year, you spent a million dollars, what's next? Yeah, we are um, thinking about that actively starting right about now. Right, the sense is, and we do have this uh, large scale developmental evaluation of the build program going on right now, and it'll continue through 2021. Um, but we're seeing really promising results, right? Um, we are seeing these grants have a transformational effect enough of the time for us to want to keep doing them and do more of them. I think in the long run, my hope would be to put the build team and the build program out of business because the long run, I would like to see Ford making most of its grants in this way and not needing a special team of organizational development experts to come in and help program staff figure out how to do them well, right? We're not there yet. So we're actively looking at a uh, potential phase two for the program, and we're thinking about how it, uh, how it should look different maybe the second time around. I make it sound really great just now, and it is really great, but boy, it had a bumpy lift off. <laughs> and in retrospect, there are a lot of things I think we would have done differently, and, um, and there are a lot of new things we want to try. So we're hoping we get a second bite at this apple starting in 2022. Excellent questions. Um, so 40, about 40% 40 of the grants are to non-US organizations. Almost all of those are to organizations that are based in the Global South and, and are of the Global South. Um, we've tried very hard and build as a value of our team um, to make sure that this, uh, this funding reaches organizations that are uh, founded and led by people from the countries where they're located. So in South Africa and Zim, we have uh, 13 build grantee organizations right now. Um, I will say the program was slower to get started outside the United States, um, partly because Ford was in this period of real strategic turmoil and change, and uh, the regional offices were um, finalizing their strategies but partly because there were some legal and philosophical challenges we really did need to sort out in some of the countries where we work. But at this time, we now have billed grants, as I said, in 26 countries, and every regional <coughs> office that we have, we have 10 around the world, is making billed grants um, and has cohorts of organizations that they're working with. So that's the first, answer your first question. I think the second question is harder. So, my preference, would, as I said, would be for this to be the four foundations default way of grant making. We're not there yet. It's about 40% of our grant making. And we just, 
decided that in order to make five-year commitments, we needed to work with organizations who were a bit of a known quantity to us. So there are only a couple of organizations in the cohort that have never received Ford funding before. That's really the exception. And most of them have been grantees of the foundation for at least two years before they come into the program. And, you know, full transparency with you, it's not transparent at all how we do it, right? So pro program teams um, get together. We have 20 different grant-making programs at the Ford Foundation. By the way, the Ford Foundation is a, um, a, a great lesson in organizational theory and perhaps a cautionary tale, but anyway, we have 20 different grant-making teams. They're each allocated a build budget. They each decide who their core strategic partners are from among their current grantees, and they nominate organizations to join the program. The build team then analyzes, conducts further due diligence um, on those nominations, and then recommends uh, sets of nominees a couple times a year to our vice presidents who make the decision. Um, I think that in future, it would be a good idea to have more transparency about all of, how all of this happens. So I really do take your point about it. And again, ultimately, I would love to see this be the way Ford approaches most of its grant-making relationships. Another question? Yeah. How would you encourage, or how, did, how would you Nonprofits, and this is to totally acknowledge, it is so easy for me to stand up here. I've worked in a foundation for 18 years and tell you you need to be more assertive with your donors, right? Um, but, but if it helps at all, I did um, earlier in my career run a nonprofit with a friend where we walked out of one meeting with a $10,000 check and we thought, thank God we can stay open for three more weeks, right? So I, I know that feeling and I know how hard it is to have these difficult conversations with funders. Um, so I think there are a few things you can do. I think the first is you can really understand your organization. You can be very clear about your mission, your strategy, and the outcomes you are trying to achieve. And you can be really clear you are not going to twist them into a pretzel for anyone else, right? Um, so that's one thing you can do. Second thing you can do is be really clear about how you're going to um, assess your own progress toward impact. Right? Actually develop a set of indicators that matter to you and measure against them. And this doesn't have to be super expensive, right? You can do this with paper surveys and you can do this with data you have. Um, but it's really important to do it so that you can document to funders that you're effective at what you do, right? Third thing is you can really understand your organization, where it is strong, where it is weak, <coughs> where you want to build it up, where you want to partner with others, and whether and where you really just don't want to work at all, right? Um, it's really important to recognize what you're good at, um, what you can get better at, and what maybe is not your lane, right? Um, the fourth thing would be uh, to really understand your true cost of doing business. So really document and defend your overhead rate. What goes into it? What does that buy you? What happens if you have to cut it? So when you go into a funder and a funder says, well, I only pay 10% overhead, you can say to them, then this is what you are expecting me to cover out of pocket, right? And maybe it is all of my monitoring, evaluation, and learning efforts. Maybe it's all of my IT. Maybe it's my rent, right? Um, but you need to be able to be really clear, and it's amazing um, to me how hard it is for most nonprofits to actually document their, the real cost of executing on a project. The final thing, and I, this is the hardest thing, is you have to have the courage to walk away from money that's not worth having. Right? And um, as a funder, I can count the number of times on one hand um, that a nonprofit has said to me, I can't do this for what you're offering me. Um, but the times when they have said it, I have said, okay, I don't have any more in my budget, but let's see who else we can get in to fund this. Let me make some calls. Or let's see how we pair this back so that I'm at least funding something you think you can deliver on. Right? And 
sometimes we agree that like it's just not going to happen, but I always walk away with a lot more respect for them because they've been really honest and open about their needs. And I think that's, that's the hardest part because some funders are just not used to being told the truth. Um, when, I, when I entered this business, my boss at the time, in the nonprofit, right, my partner, he said, well, congratulations, you're never going to have a bad meal or an honest compliment ever again. That's pretty much been true, right? But you, you have to have the courage. And, and the funders that are worth having will really respect you for it. Foundations 
around the country, some very, very large, some quite small and local, who have already have been funding like this since before we were, who we have learned from. And we're starting to talk about what can we do together to try to move our sector. Because our sector really needs to move. Right? We're in philanthropy because we want, we're in the solutions business. And we've become part of the problem. The way our nonprofit sector is financed, we are part of the problem. So we have a responsibility to fix it. Okay. So Chris is telling me that we should move into our panel. So I'll welcome them up to the stage and let him introduce. And I'm going to go take the chair on the very end. And please don't make me talk a whole lot more. in all different kinds of circumstances in different parts of the world. But the question is, can it work for all different kinds of foundations in different circumstances? So the thing is, it already has been. Uh, Ford is late to the party, and there are many other funders who have been taking this patient approach for years. We need to acknowledge that and lead with that. Um, so in this panel, we're going to dig into some local examples of this. And also understand from a nonprofit leader's perspective how this kind of support changes the relationship or it doesn't. Um, so, Rosemary Dorsett, let's start with you. Um, you're a vice president at the Indiana Philanthropy Alliance, well known no doubt to many folks in this room. And you came to IPA after 17 years at the Central Indiana Community Foundation. So, you've seen from a variety of perspectives what this kind of patient, long-term, flexible support can actually do for nonprofits and donors. It seems like a slam dunk. Well, why don't more funders do it? What gets in the way? Right. Um, so, um, in my current role at the Indiana Philanthropy Alliance, in addition to being the vice president, I run the our gift program, which stands for, which is the term that Lily Endowment uses, <clears throat> pardon me, for all of its work with community foundations for close to 30 years now which is training and technical assistance. So essentially, we're at 30 years of capacity building work that the foundation, that Lilly has supported. <clears throat> so what you're seeing, that is incredibly patient philanthropy. Looking around the state, working with community foundations, so, and I, and I, there's a great desire to work on capacity building, but I'm going to echo some of the things Kathy said. Uh, at a very practical level, there is that challenge of choice. If you choose one thing, you're not choosing another. If you're saying, okay, we only have uh, $200,000, $300,000 to give, um, if we make a multi-year commitment, uh, maybe we set aside $50,000, well, that's $50,000 we won't have next year to decide on. And um, we're gonna take that choice away. So there's that challenge of choice and and then there's the, the leap of faith, thank you. Um, then there's the leap of faith that, that Kathy was talking about, which is, is this gonna make a difference? You know, it's much easier as a funder to say, we funded those desks at the preschool, or chairs at the preschool, there they are. Um, we funded uh, the freezer, at the food pantry, there it is. Um, we funded a program that was supposed to serve 50 kids, and we had them count, and yes, indeed, there were 50 kids there. Um, so it's really hard to say, well, let's, what would we do to improve, improve capacity? You know, the word capacity building actually doesn't mean much of anything until you attach capacity to what? 
capacity to manage your finances better, to have capacity to uh, evaluate your programs better, capacity to um, uh, have a more effective board. Um, you really need to attach something to it. We just use it like a general term, like capacity building. But when you really think about it, it doesn't actually mean anything without some uh, additional descriptors. And so in, so how do you get past that initial reluctance to um, the need to have that countable, tangible thing? Once you do answer the question, capacity building for what, is, is that the key or sort of are there additional things that need to happen for donors to be willing to engage that kind of support once they're clear on capacity building for what? I think there needs to be someone in the room that says, what about this? I mean, at some level, there's just a, there'd have to be someone there tossing that out as an idea and saying, well, let's think about that. And we've seen that. I've got some examples around Indiana where we've had people like that in the room saying, okay, if you're not comfortable with this, what else can we do? We hear all the time from community foundations around the state, we hear all the time about, yeah, we're not, we don't like the proposals we get. Um, they're not um, they're not creative enough. They're not innovative enough. I usually ask, well, how big are your grants? Well, three thousand dollars. So you know, I'm like, oh, let's be honest. How much change the world creativity are you going to get for three thousand dollars? You're going to get, you know, desks at a preschool. So um, so it's hard to. Um, so I think you know, there's that discomfort that that. Um, uh, discomfort with the status quo. Okay, so somebody needs to be in that room with ideas that say, well, what about this? And I think sometimes that's about all it takes to say, oh, there's another way to think about this. Yeah, so that maybe just open people's eyes to the yeah. possibilities. Mm -hmm. It's not that there's necessarily a lack of willingness to do it. It may just be a lack of awareness. People are that just used to what they're used to. And yeah. this is what we do because it's what we've always done. And until there's somebody there saying, how about something else? That's what we're going to get. And it, right, and it's so comforting to be able to rely on, on what we know. And frankly, also, when there's, you know, possibility of scrutiny or pushback from the community feels safer to rely on the thing that's known. So yes, yes. I get that. That's very real. Um, Jennifer, let's turn to you, Jennifer Vigoran. You're the CEO of Second Helpings, which a few years ago received an extraordinary gift from the Lilly Endowment um, to build up a restricted endowment and to support some key infrastructure investments, this kind of capacity building. Um, what has this kind of support helped Second Helpings do that you weren't able to do before? Thank you. Well, first of all, Kathy talked about due diligence. And for us, this entire process with the Lillian Down began with some serious due diligence, much along the lines of deep, digging into our finances, meeting with our leadership team, meeting our board leaders, and really building that confidence in the organization. Um, we received uh, $7.5 million in what the Lilly Endowment refers to as sustainability grants. Um, these grants, they've now done, I believe, three cycles of these grants. We were in the second cycle, the first cycle uh, for human, human and social services. And when we received that grant, it came in two, it general, these grants generally come in two parts. Part one, the largest part being an endowment for the organization, the smaller part being a three-year grant um, in sustainability building investments. And the first challenge was to sit down with our executive committee and talk about what does sustainability mean for this particular organization. Um, and so as we broke it down, it meant three, really three things, and that's what this grant uh, reflected. One was the financial wherewithal, the financial sustainability uh, that communicated uh, to, the, to the entire community that we were here to stay. That this, that, and, when, when, and the reason we found that was significant is we started to see planned gifts coming through. Some of our volunteers started to say, oh, this organization really will be around long past when I'm gone. I can make that long-term investment in the organization. 
Um, it gave us the resilience so that with that endowment, we knew we'd be able to step up when the uh, when, if, when the economy turns. And you know, the irony is, when the economy turns, foundations have less money, and not for profits, particularly in the human services sector, are expected to step up even more and, and have a greater demand. So we knew that that endowment was going to give us more resilience to be able to do that. It also gave us the ability to say, OK, if we have a major investment in this organization, a new program, a new initiative, a new investment we need to make, we will be able to make it even if we can't find a funder to support it. And that was a big, that was a big uh, confidence builder for our organization. As one of my colleagues who received one of these grants said, it gives us the ability to dream. It gives us the ability to go beyond, are we making payroll, to what do we really want to do, what do we really uh, intend to do for this community for the long haul. The second part, uh, when we look at the actual, uh, sh the three-year investments that we were making, um, one of the big initiatives was, what does it take to make sure we continue to operate on un uninhibited on a daily basis? So that's some of the not very sexy things like generators and things like that. But the largest part was in what does it take to attract more people to our mission? Whether they are volunteers, whether they are donors, more people to support the work. Because what makes us more sustainable than being able to generate more funding for the future? So for us, that was actually a big investments in fundraising and in marketing and actually some facilities uh, investments as well. How did you go about prioritizing those? You talked about um, attracting more people to the mission, but among all the, all the different things you could have done, how did you go about winnowing down on what those needs were? We actually had, were pretty clear on what they were. Um, we had a pretty uh, good sense of what we needed to do. Um, we, I had a, uh, we did a development audit several years beforehand. And uh, I was, we were between development directors and I thought that at the end of the development audit, the develop, uh, they would say, okay, here's how we're gonna go about getting your new development director. And at the end of the development audit, they sat me down and they said, you know, you can't afford the development director you need. <laughs> this is not what I was hoping for. So for three years, they said, you should be the development director for the organization. And for three years, I was. I have no idea how I did it, but I did. And what this enabled us to do was to go out and hire that senior level development officer to really lead that initiative and focus on it in a strategic way. Someone who had far more experience than I did and knowledge about uh, the intricacies of development. Um, and uh, to really build a strategic, a really solid strategic plan around development. So you're saying that this wasn't something you had to come up with once the opportunity became available. You had sitting in a drawer somewhere a, a development audit that had a clear sense of what the next steps were, but instead of being able to execute on that, you had to pull double duty while already being the CEO um, for three years, waiting for someone to come along who would be willing to fund a clear plan. I haven't really thought about it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just think that's an object lesson for funders, right? I mean, um, and, and to ask, did you ever, to the, the point that was brought up earlier about how to sort of make the case, um, were there any funders with whom you felt you had, who had demonstrated that they were trustworthy enough that you could say to them, hey, I've got this plan, we could use a development director, but I need some operating funds to do that. Did you, were there any funders you felt you had the truth for Lily that you had the trust that you could say that? You know, in retrospect, as I look back at that era now, yes. Uh, there's no question in my mind that there are funders I probably could have sat down and had that conversation with. And part of it, part of the challenge when you're making, as many of you know, when you're making that investment in a, in a senior level development person, 
this is not an investment that's going to turn results year one. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is an investment that's going to turn your results year three. And that's a big investment for the organization. Um, and uh, one that really this gave us the comfort and the ability to do. I would say that part of the challenge when we talk about going to other funders yeah. is we're still trying to pay operating costs, right? Yeah. So this was really truly dedicated funds above and beyond operating, above and beyond our, our existing program initiatives because we were pushing programs at the same time and programs were growing at the same time. This was really something beyond all of that. Yeah. And so I guess what I'm getting at is, is from the funder's perspective, gosh, it wouldn't have been great if one of your funders had said to you, what's your dream for how you can build the organization? Do, do you have plans about this? You know, is there something in the drawer there that you've been dreaming about that what additional capacity would look like? I put that responsibility on our shoulders as funders to have that kind of relationship with organizations where we can um, create the space for nonprofits to, to, to dream big and to share those dreams and to be willing to support them. Well, Chris, part of the, part of the challenge there mm -hmm. is that if you ask most of us who are CEOs, what our dreams are for the organization, we'll talk about the mission. Yeah. We'll talk about programs. We'll talk about how we want to serve more people. And we'll talk about, because we're going to put our programs first. That's yeah. just, you know, that's, it's in our DNA. Yeah. So the real challenge is when somebody says, this is not going to programs. Now what do you want to do? Wow. Yeah. What are, and that's Kevin, why. That's why we ended up splitting the bill grant and saying most of it's going to be general support. You can do every, anything you want, but part of it has to be for you to strengthen your institution. And we had, you know, we had some pushback on that. We had people in a, in, within Ford say, if you really trust the organization, why are you restricting any of the money, right? Why don't you just give it all to them? Um, but what most of the organizations say to us is, you restricted a little bit of the money, right? Because it actually gave us permission uh, to think about things we had not allowed ourselves to think about before. You know, some funders think they can only grant to things that have been requested. I mean, I really, I mean it. Sometimes I remember being with the board some time ago and saying, "Well, you should go look into funding this." Well, we haven't been asked. Can we? Can we fund something? That, like, of course you can. But they really we're not sure about that. So there are times when it's just appropriate to say, we need to initiate a conversation with that organization. They're important to our community. We know they're having some struggles. Let's talk with them about how we can be helpful. But that is not a behavior that we see a lot. It's a lot of just waiting for proposals to come in. And if someone doesn't ask, maybe we won't do it. When I was at the Indianapolis Foundation, on several occasions, we had a proposal that we funded. But we also knew that the organization had some, um, I think in a couple of cases, was some board issues. And so we added to the grant money for board governance. They didn't ask for it, but we knew they needed it. So we said, you know, come on here. We want to talk about this. We'll give you the grant, no problem. But we, we'd like to give you some more. Um, and again, that's not the way most funders think. Like, well, if they didn't ask for it, I guess they don't need it. And sometimes people are not entirely sure what they need. And I think there's there's a way of thinking about that that can translate into any type of grant that you do, even not a capacity building grant. Um, I'm in the process of, of negotiating a grant um, that has a project focus with an organization that we'd supported in the past, but it had been a couple of years. And uh, it was to work on a particular dimension of DEI, which is the, the, the strategy that I program, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, in talking with them about it, they suggested four different things they could do, each with a, a budget range that was pretty wide, let's say from one to five dollars each, right? Um, and that, so that a little bit, and consulting with some colleagues, that, that a little bit was worrying me, like, do they not really know how much they need to do? And in talking with them, it became clear beyond the project, just the organization overall. It's a newish group. They're having a little bit of trouble attracting extra operating dollars. 
So we asked for a more detailed budget, and what was really encouraging was to see that we gave an amount that we thought could, you know, that we had available that could cover this, and um, most of what they proposed, to your point, Jennifer, about the mission being first, we said we'd like to combine some operating dollars and some support for these particular programs. Almost all of what they suggested was for the programmatic work because they wanted to do it well, and then a little bit left over for the operations. And that, that honesty about um, what it would take to do the work well, then you know, encouraged us to be able to say, actually, we still believe these operating dollars are useful, so let's top up the grant a little bit to add more of those operating dollars into it. Um, so I think it, it is about that, that back and forth and the, and the relationship and, and how you start to develop a more trusting relationship that can unlock some more of those funds. But you're right, I, thankfully I didn't have to ask. Kathy was supportive, I didn't have to ask. Like, they didn't ask for it, can I still do that? <laughs> in fact, you said to me earlier in the year, you should be making longer, more restricted grants. You've given me the, the credit for that. Um, so speaking of capacity building, um, and to your point earlier, Rosemary, um, that's a term that can mean a lot of different things. Capacity building for what? Um, but the how it's delivered also matters. Right? Mm -hmm. So training programs are a, a, a popular way of, of doing it, but there are others. Right. What are forms of capacity building that you've seen that have genuinely been impactful or even transformative for organizations? So I'll uh, share a couple uh, from community foundations that are here in the room today. Uh, so the um, Hendricks County Community Foundation a few years ago, uh, three or four years ago, um, had that discomfort, the grant committee had this discomfort with, we don't like these proposals, you know, um, they're just not interesting, etc. So there's not a lot of unrestricted money there, and the, there was leadership in the room, the former program officer, Eric Kessel, is here, said, uh, okay, so let's step back and think about this. Let's, let's take a look. And from this, from that conversation, which, you know, was a series of conversations, they came up with a suggestion, a recommendation to the board that the board went along with, that they actually transitioned all of their unrestricted grant dollars into capacity building, and that's what they've been doing for the last three years. And they had a multi-pronged approach. One is a training series. Uh, the second part of it is professional development, funding, um, you know, attending trainings, conferences, things like that. Functional capacity, which is stuff like computers or equipment, and then organizational capacity, strategic planning, governance, program evaluation, things like that. Um, that was. That's a big deal. In, in our field, that was a very um, uh, significant transition. Uh, we've seen other community foundations carve out a piece of their money. Uh, Boone County Community Foundation is also here. They've taken a little different approach, more coaching with selected organizations, where, then, where they do something similar to Bill, like an organizational assessment, and what do they need. They work with consultants then that can deliver if it's governance, if it's program, things like that. Um, so those are two examples that we've seen with, in community foundations around the state that are beyond just, a, and there's nothing wrong with the training series, but go go the next level, the next level of depth, more customized, personalized work. Yeah. Jennifer, as you all thought about um, putting some of these lily dollars to work on capacity building, um, did you feel like you had access to the right resources to be able to do that. You know, you had already had the development audit, but in terms of building out the, the fundraising capacity and the financial capacity, um, what were some things that were helpful for you all as far as building that capacity? Um, so I think there, I think one of the things that we're still, I mean, there's some of it we're still struggling with. We are now at the end of our three years, so we've spent down almost all of these dollars, but, um, there were parts of this that were easy and there are parts of this that are still hard. Um, certainly the big, the big first step was finding the right development director. And that was, that was not easy. Um, really finding somebody committed to our mission who had the kinds of experience we were looking for. Um, and who was going to stick around. That's important. Um, 
right now I'd say the piece we're struggling with is the marketing side and develop you know this is not, marketing is not something that we're necessarily really great at being with strategic marketers is not for profits um, so we're tap right now tapping into uh, people in the corporate sector um, and some consultants <coughs> in building a marketing committee to look at the work we've done and continue to help us build on that that's uh, because it's not when, when we talk about marketing in this context it's not just uh, it's part of it's yes it's about donor acquisition and donor retention and communications it's about being kind donors which is a huge part of what we do um, and it's also about uh, raising awareness of programs for client for clients who are potential referrers so we've been putting a lot of resources into marketing as well in that and again, thank goodness you have those dedicated dollars because that's an extensive set of activities. Um, interesting the point about finding a development director and, and helping they stick around. Um, what are what are some of the things that you you feel you needed to help make that possible? Part of it was being, the first part was being able to compensate somebody at a level yeah. where they where we were going to be able to attract a seasoned professional. Um, and we were going to be able to attract someone who had managed teams before, uh, someone who had worked in a variety of environments, um, looking for someone who uh, stayed with their previous employers for some period of time, um, because we knew this was a long-term investment for the organization, and we couldn't have somebody who was just going to be with us for two years. That wasn't going to get us to the to the end point. And if I could just say so. Many of the, if you ask the build grantee organizations what they're spending their institutional strengthening dollars on, the number one thing they say is talent management. Right? So they are, uh, that includes everything from hiring an HR director and really building out an HR function within the organization to adjusting compensation to diversity, equity, inclusion to professional development. And, um, we funded an organization in Mexico that's a very well-established civil society organization in Mexico. It's been around about 40 years, very large, about 40 employees. Um, and they did a compensation study in their first year of bill grant. They'd never done one before. And they found that they were paying their staff 40% less on average than other nonprofits in Mexico City. So they were counting on their reputation to attract and retain people, and they were underpaying them for what they were worth. So they then used a big chunk of the build grant to raise compensation and to put a compensation policy into place so that didn't happen again. They saw their staff retention numbers go way up. That's actually precisely what one of our local community centers who received one of these sustainability grants did was use this to raise their minimum wage and invest in their staff. Yeah. The critical things you do, because I mean, that has a ripple effect then, right? I mean, that makes it, that's one of the ways to, to retain a seasoned development director. They're going to want a group of folks to work with who are well motivated and up for it because development is something everybody needs to do with. And that's something we look at very carefully each year. We look at how much our folks are making, what the market is, and making sure that we're not relying on, gee, isn't this a great place to work, and isn't this funny? You get a free lunch every day. Um, <laughs> that, you know, that there's more to it than that. Yeah, yeah. Attracting people to the mission, as you talked about earlier, but there needs to be that bottom line there, and that's where, that's where funders need to deliver.